One other thing, our, uh, our luncheon speaker, Representative Swalwell, quite frankly, is, is the freshest breath of air that, that I have caught wind of since I first learned that Ronald Reagan used to get together with Chip O'Neill. <laughs> the theme of uh, this particular panel, how do regulatory agencies consider economic impacts and environmental consequences during the decision-making process, or words to that effect. You know, environmental protection has become a strong and a shared societal value in our society, especially here in the greater Bay Area, especially among the members and supporters of the Bay Planning Coalition. Sustainability is a buzzword of the moment among folks in private industry and the non-governmental organization community, but it is absolutely core to the workings of the regulatory and the oversight community represented here today. With that as a given, a persistent challenge facing us is how best to continue on the path to achieve sound environmental progress without damaging the beginnings of restoring the region's economic recovery from the late unlamented recession. From a simplistic view, cutting environmental regulations in the short term does not of and by itself create jobs, and it, it doesn't really deliver compliance cost savings without simultaneously depriving society of the long-term economic benefits in terms of natural resources we conserve and the public health which we protect as investments both for today and for the future. That said, from a selfish partisan perspective, however, I also have to acknowledge that all too often the experience of private industry is that the economic impacts of regulations are insufficiently assessed before they are opposed. And that uncertainty about regulatory strictures continues to be a disincentive to those businesses which would like to commit to investments in the plans necessary for growth and the creation of jobs here in the Bay Area. Our distinguished panel of senior regional regulatory agency officials and their impressive resumes are way beyond my experience. Each of them have scars and can display the figurative battle ribbons, one while carrying out their defined charges to serve the public's interest. At the same time, our sole panelist, carrying the banner of private enterprise and commerce, probably can also share stories, if not of permitting wars waged, certainly of regulatory trials endured, if not the tribulation and consternation that is so much a part of complying with agency oversight at the municipal, county, regional, state, and federal levels. Each will offer an opening perspective, which we hope will provide dialogue with substance among the panelists, along with you, and along with the insights to be gained from their responses to questions which you may have. As a prompt, I'd like to challenge you to work off your lunch by multitasking. Listen responsively to each of the panelists' remarks, while drafting those thoughtful questions on blue cards provided at your tables and pass them to our volunteer proctors. We'll open things and I'm not going to go into folks' resumes because they're all in the programs in front of you. Our first speaker will be Bruce Wolf, the Executive Officer of the San Francisco Regional Water Quality Control Board. Bruce. Thank you. And we get the challenge of being right after lunch. Uh, so it was a provocative topic, which hopefully will keep you awake and we'll do our best. I was trying to think of the best way to kick this off to keep uh, your attention, keep things provocative. And uh, I had something set up, but then I was at a meeting earlier this week in Sacramento with uh, State Water Board Management, and I was fed the key line. A senior manager of the State Water Board said, our job is to make people spend money. We have met the enemy and he is us. Um, or should I say, welcome to my hell. Uh, I, I, frankly, I don't agree with that at all. Uh, so I want to go over a little bit where we're coming from as a water quality agency, what we're trying to accomplish, what limitations, opportunities uh, that presents, and how we can make uh, lemonade out of lemons to a certain degree. 
For us at the Water Board, our mission is to preserve, protect, restore, enhance the San Francisco Bay waters for all the people. And to me, uh, some of you have heard me say this before, we're basically here in the Bay Area because of the water. And I, I would say we remain here, that we have a vibrant uh, economy, community, high quality of life because of water quality. And in fact, that is the quality of life. So essentially, I view it that we're preserving, protecting, restoring, and enhancing quality of life. So how do we do that? We drill down a little bit. We identify in our basin plan the beneficial uses of all the region's waters. And there's about 15 of them. They range from municipal drinking water to wildlife habitat to navigation to recreational use. As I say, about 15. And here's a hint something you can take home with you. We sometimes, when we interview people to uh, work with us, we actually ask them how many beneficial uses can you name? So there's something you can take when you ever want a job with us. Use that. Um, so I've yet to say anything about spending money, but uh, here's where the dreaded rules and regulations come in. So to help us preserve, protect, enhance, restore, our main tools are the Federal Clean Water Act and the State Water Code. Both of those operate under the principle that to impact the beneficial uses of waters is a privilege, not a right, and you need a permit to do so. Essentially, most of you know this, there's, there's two types of permits, one largely driven by Section 402 of the Federal Clean Water Act that addresses ongoing point source discharges, such as municipal wastewater treatment plants, refineries, stormwater discharges, which some of us say that's really a point source. Um, and under Section 404, Clean Water Act, the more one-time or periodic work in waters, such as uh, flood control maintenance, dredging, fill, etc. And these have been in place for many years. Under the 402 for point sources, we're basically using technology-based uh, requirements or water quality-based requirements. And those are pretty much spelled out in the rules, the regulations. Under 404, we're using uh, the 404 B1 guidelines largely determine alternatives, and that, that revolves around the least environmental damaging practical alternative, which is uh, a license for attorneys to practice, in my mind. But um, anyway, uh, this sort of implies that complying with those may cost. Uh, there has been money when Federal Clean Water Act mandated that all wastewater treatment plants needed to achieve secondary standards. There were state and federal grants set up. We still have some state uh, revolving fund loans and grants, and I was encouraged by what we've been hearing today on WERDA and other course funding, but it's clear that there's not enough funding out there. Nonetheless, I try to, with our agency, impart the philosophy that uh, if you do this, such as control your runoff or avoid flooding, you'll save money. And oh, by the way, at the same time, you'll be in compliance. I think a corollary to that is there's nothing in the rules and regulations that say that we can't achieve our goals to preserve and protect and restore and enhance while other people achieve their goals. And so that's something, again, I try to impart on, on staff that uh, there's, there's no win-lose and I try to avoid with the, the Note here was we have permitting wars, and we tried to avoid that. Um, so we tried to embrace the flexibility, and really what that comes down to is how do we how do we embrace the flexibility that the rules and regulations provide us? Uh, we do want to work with people when you're coming in with a well thought out plan that recognizes that need to preserve, protect, restore. Uh, otherwise, if we're, we're trying to look at something that really isn't well thought out, then we have a 15-page response letter, and then we sort of back into our corners of saying, okay, let's just, just come into compliance and do it. Uh, another way to do this is if you don't know, uh, ask. Ask up front. Uh, you're going to hear later from Phil Tagami. I'm not sure if he's here yet, but I was pleased a couple months ago, he called me over to the office and uh, walked me through the Oakland Army Base project before submitting their permit. And that was helpful to get a good understanding of, of what's uh, coming up. And I think also it's helpful to listen to the message that the agencies provide. Uh, some of you recall last year the 
the brouhaha over the Lucas uh, Grady Ranch project in Marin County. And at the end, uh, Lucas said, well, those damn regulatory agencies came up with all these things late in the game. No, we'd, we'd essentially said uh, three years in advance that the proposal to put 80,000 cubic yards of fill into a creek was not a restoration project and that they needed to come up with something different. And finally, after three years, recognizing that, that I apparently scuttled the project. Um, and I think it's also something that we need to pull not only all the agencies together, pull the stakeholders together. You heard earlier about where we are in America's Cup. I think that was a success of getting all the agencies together to be able to work through issues early and get that done. I think LTMS is an example. I agree with the write-up in today's programs about the approach uh, Bay Planning advocates for moving forward. We've been through 12 years of that. I think we have an opportunity to continue to improve as long as we all work together on it. And I think also, uh, as part of this to avoid the permitting wars, you have to give government uh, folks some credit. Don't view it as an us versus them. I was born three miles up the road here and have been, been in this, the Bay Area all my life. And we really want to uh, reach resolution with something that works for all of us. We're all citizens here. We're all trying to enjoy the quality life. And finally, a tie into what you're going to hear later this afternoon on infrastructure that I think there's opportunities with uh, projects to take the broader multi-benefit, multi-objective approach, and we want to work with you on that. The infrastructure aspect didn't call out, but I think it's important to note that water and wastewater both received Ds in uh, ASCE's recent report card, and that's something we need to check. We need to look for the uh, multi-benefit opportunities to address that. Phil Tagami, when he had me over, pointed out that in the Oakland Army base, which essentially isn't occupied at this point, there's still two million gallons of drinking water used each month. That's drinking water that's leaking. That's old infrastructure, and that's the type of stuff that's going to kill us. So we have to work together on those uh, opportunities. Let me close with um, something that I, I pulled out of uh, David McCullough's book on John Adams. Uh, if you haven't read that, I really encourage you to get a sense of where our government was formed. And in putting together the Constitution, first he put together the Massachusetts Constitution and then U.S. Constitution, he sat back and said, what should government be about? And he came to the conclusion that government should provide the most happiness for the most people. And I buy that. That may not be happening in Washington, that may not be happening in Sacramento, but hopefully we can make that happen in the Bay Area. I mean, essentially, that's a revolutionary uh, concept. And that, to me, is quality of life. So thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Our next panelist is Alexis Strauss, our 2013 Frank Berger Award winner and Deputy Regional Administrator with US EPA's Region 9. Alexis. I've missed working with some of you directly since changing my job about a year ago at EPA, but we've learned a lot together over the past 15 years in our long-term management strategy for managing dredging. And I'd like to stay very close to that in terms of the opportunities that lie ahead. It was a really important aspect. Pardon? Closer. Now I can even hear myself. Um, it was really important that we bring together the four key agencies, the core, BCDC, the regional board, and EPA. And I think that that continues to have been an example where we can have meaningful and intelligent problem solving and conversations with all of the interests that, have, that revolve around the Delta and the Bay for permitting, for deepening, for restoration and the like. We have worked hard to bring in other agencies whose permission or review and comment is also needed, such as Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA. And I think our efforts continue to bear fruit, even though it's not um, optimized. It's still an area that we continue to build that relationship and try and make it work. I noticed over the years that sometimes we struggled to do as good of a job quantifying the environmental benefits as the economic costs. And part of our panel today certainly focuses, and your questions may focus, on how do we really look at the economic costs Many of the tensions revolve around water quality standards. 
when water quality standards are adopted by EPA and more typically by the state, that economic analysis typically happens years prior at the time the standard is, in, is adopted. Um, the flexibility, as Bruce just noted, lies in how the implementation can be structured. And I think therein lies always a meaningful conversation, not about what the numeric standard or the narrative standard may be, but where is the relevant flexibility with regard to that standard and how does it affect the project? And we can certainly come back to that. So clearly what the CORE's projects are and what the CORE's benefit cost ratio drives so much of what we are going to be able to do and focus on how that project is bid is key. What are the alternatives that are on the table? Which of those alternatives is going to get selected? And how can we make some of our key goals like beneficial reuse work for us? We recently came out with a 12-year review, the multi-agency review that I think must be on our collective DMMO website. And we realized that we need to go further in giving more flexibility to implementing the management plan. We need to more aggressively pursue other beneficial reuse options in the Bay. And I'm truly intrigued by that opportunity as well as by that challenge. I am interested in what can we do in the South Bay? What can we do with a sediment bank? How can we make materials handling and rehandling work well? How can we try more pilot projects in a way that doesn't drive some of the parties away for fear of a permanent precedent, but is a good scientific pilot project to see does it work for this location? Do the costs work? It's always difficult sometimes to pull together the money to fund some of those small projects. I'm hopeful that some of the smaller interests in the South Bay will be available to participate. Um, I know that will be challenging. But when we work together, when we have enough lead time to deal with some of this, we do some amazing things together. And I'd like to just um, give you an anecdote before turning it over to the Colonel. You may wonder why this handsome tugboat is up on the screen. Um, this handsome tugboat, I guess I fancied myself having a tugboat at one time. Um, this was the Edward Engel, and she was built in 45, I think in Long Beach. She presently lies, not as the Edward Engel, you know, flying the seas, but she presently renamed the Respect. And if we go to the next slide, you can see her in the um, Oakland Estuary. Oh, I have no clicker. Sorry. Thank you, sir. Excellent. You, you're the engineer, no doubt. Okay. So this is her with a car float in the Oakland Estuary. I don't know what year this was. And then let's go to the last slide. We promised no more than three PowerPoints, and I hate PowerPoints, so these are my PowerPoints. Um, this is when she became the Respect in Oakland in 1982, maybe with regard to Aretha Franklin or something, um, not as handsome as Aretha Franklin. Unfortunately, um, at some point, she was vandalized, and the next day she sank. And she still lies, unfortunately, not far from where we sit, near the Park Street Bridge. Um, she is submerged in the estuary and marked with buoys and a flashing light. She's now um, our next challenge. On Monday, a team of EPA, Coast Guard, Cal Recycle, and I think core folks went together to various, up to about 40 sites in the Oakland Estuary, looking at vessels and um, submerged wrecks and other impediments. And we are looking to do, under Cal Recycle's leadership, a major project to raise um, the abandoned wrecks and to deal with the abandoned vessels. And we're hopeful that we can do a great job. This is long overdue. The catalyst for this team effort is the Oakland Police Department and many of the people who make a living or live right outside the window here along the o Oakland waterfront. I think they're tired of dealing with the blight. They're tired of dealing with the uh, crime and the meth heads. Um, who ply their trade right outside the door. And it would be an amazing boost to show what we could do as a team if we can take the money that we've copped together and as a team of agencies um, bring all of these together. I'll give you just a few um, numerics and then we'll turn it over to the Colonel. Cal Recycle has about $650,000 from the Costco Busan settlement and they match that money in-house. So they have about 1.3 million if we find hazardous substances as we've had, as we found in other such circumstances like in the Petaluma River, 
um, then EPA will be able to bring Superfund or CERCLA funding to the fore. And the Coast Guard has promised to open the Oil Pollution Act funding if there are Oil Pollution Act um, problems to deal with. So the Corps is bringing resources, like its vessels, the Raccoon or the Dillard, to collect floating debris when the wrecks are raised. Um, they have equipment and backup, and they've offered a staging area for disposal of debris, as well as to raise a small sunken fishing vessel east of Coast Guard Island. So this is going to play out starting in late May under Cal Recycles leadership. And I wanted you to know what is possible. A year ago, this was just kind of a gleam in a couple of other people's eyes. And we, we really wanted to be able to show that we could do this against all odds. And for us at EPA, it's part of a really important emphasis on addressing marine debris, which I'd love to talk with you about at another time. And with that, let me yield to Colonel Baker. Thank you, Alexis. Our next panelist is Lieutenant Colonel John Baker, San Francisco District Commander with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you, John Coleman and the Bay Planning Coalition for inviting me to speak today. Can everybody hear me? Uh, Richard, Mark in the back, hear me, I'm good? Okay, great. So I had the good fortune last year of attending this event as part of my transition into my j current job as commander of the San Francisco district. I sat right over there trying to avoid the, the, uh, the sunlight. And as I sat there, I was absolutely certain as I surveyed the room that I was the least knowledgeable person on San Francisco Bay among the whole audience. So here we are a year later, I've been in this job for 10 months, and as I survey around the audience right now, I'm afraid I may still be the least knowledgeable person for San Francisco Bay. But the good news is that I'm part of a fantastic team, and if I could have the other folks that are on my team in the San Francisco district, if you could stand up, uh, I won't list you all by name, I just wanna make sure you don't fall asleep during my speech. <laughs> So I have the good fortune to serve with some phenomenal Americans and, and to work collaboratively with a great group of stakeholders, many of you represented here in the audience today. I have just a couple slides that I want to talk about. And the first thing that I'll cover is the Corps of Engineers mission. Because I always get asked a question when I ride on the BART, people are like, hey, welcome back, soldier. And I think, great. <laughs> it's been 10 hours since I last rode on the BART. Thank you. The, um, but people say, why is the Corps of Engineers here? Why is the Corps of, and, and so then I get to give them my sales pitch, my 30 second pitch on what the Army Corps of Engineers does. So I've committed our mission statement to memory. Our mission statement is to provide vital engineering solutions in collaboration with our stakeholders to secure our nation, to energize our economy, and to reduce risk from disaster. Did I get it? I think pretty good. I practice it every day on the bar. <laughs> now the words here are important, and so I want to highlight a couple of them. You've already heard from Mark Bierman, our lead economist. He talked about benefit-cost ratio, and you've heard from Center Boxer and others how we just don't have enough resources to go around. So we have to pick and choose those ones which have the greatest value to the United States to make those projects, federal projects, and then to invest in those. So vital is important. Now, collaboration. We also know that in the Corps of Engineers, we by ourselves aren't going to fix things. We can't, we have to work as a team. So the collaboration is very key as well. Now strengthen our, econ energize our economy. People say, why is that part of the military mission? Well, I haven't been someone who's deployed into combat three times, uh, believe me, you don't want to be shot at. And as Mayor Kwan mentioned this morning, jobs stop bullets. I would go one step further and say strong economies prevent wars. So if we can do that in the San Francisco district then, then, and across the nation, then we prevent having to send soldiers overseas three, four, five or more times. We don't have to sink a trillion dollars of our national dollars overseas. So that's why strengthening our economy is important. Now, there's no mention of the environment anywhere in here. And I'm up here today as a, a environmental regulator. 
And so I just want to say that it's not that we don't have an environmental mission. Absolutely we do. We also have a requirement to be fiscally responsible, but we don't put that in our mission statement either. There are very clear laws and authorities whereby the Army Corps of Engineers executes its regulatory mission. So those are acknowledged. We just don't put them in our mission statement because those are things that we must do. This mission statement are those things that we endeavor to do. And our job is all about getting results. My last slide here, and I know that it might be a bit of a strain for folks. I'm going to try to describe it for you. So this is just a little bit of information about the San Francisco district, which has been serving our nation in the San Francisco Bay Area since 1866. We are, in fact, the oldest Corps of Engineer district on the Pacific Coast. Started out with an Army major who came across the mountains with a gunny sack of money and a handful of surveyors to survey the Transcontinental Railroad and do work in the San Francisco Bay Area. We now have 290 employees, five uniformed uh, service members, and 285 civilians. And then listed here in the two text boxes are two of our major deliverables, either delivering a project or a regulatory action. And so the left picture shows our area, 40,000 square miles along the central and northern California coast and southern Oregon. We have over 900 miles of coastline and a population of over 6.5 million people that we reduce risk from disaster for. In that area, we have 139 active projects. These are not only those projects that are authorized in AWERDA, but they're also ones that we support other federal agencies, whether that be the Department of Veterans Affairs or the Coast Guard or somebody else. But 139 projects that total about $100 million. That's what we expect to do this year. Also in this year, in that same area, we expect to execute over 1,000 regulatory actions. Now, the whole purpose of today is do we understand the economic impacts? You bet. Of those 1,000 plus permits that we expect to, uh, to administer or actions that we expect to administer, we estimate that, and I've got my economists back here to verify, we estimate that that's worth $30 billion of direct economic impact. That's in the dollar value of a construction project. That's in the dollar value of a real estate investment or that's the potential sale or the real estate value of a mitigation credit that could be sold in an action. So we are acutely aware of the economic impacts of what we do every day. Now the right picture talks about what we do in the greater San Francisco Bay Area. And we have little icons on there that depict the actual projects and where they are. I know it may be difficult to see each of the icon symbols represents a different type of project. But the largest number of those projects have to do with navigation. The second largest category of projects are those that deal with environmental and ecosystem restoration. So again, we recognize that here in our center of mass, the San Francisco Bay Area, we have the responsibility to balance economic development with environmental stewardship. You can also see, or, or those that can't see, uh, in this San Francisco Bay Area are civil works projects, those that come in a, that are authorized in a word of bill that we get civil works funding for, comprise over one third of our total district projects, but over 60% of the total value. So there's a greater percentage of our workload that's just here in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's an even higher percentage when you look at regulatory actions. Of our 1,000 plus in our whole area, over 900 of them are in the San Francisco Bay Area, a full 90%. And then over two thirds of the total economic impact of those regulatory actions, an estimated $22 billion, is here in the San Francisco Bay Area. So again, we recognize the environmental impacts of everything that we do and and that we have a requirement to get results and to balance economic development with environmental stewardship. I was also told by a regulatory chief that I should make a plug that although we may not deliver the, the regulatory actions with the speed uh, and agility that, that we would all like, that we ultimately approve 99% 
of all permit actions that come to us. And there are other regulatory actions that we do, but we are trying to find a way to say yes. That's the, that's the message that I would leave you with. Um, but sometimes it requires some negotiation and some give and take so that at the end of the day we can balance economic development with the environmental stewardship. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colonel Baker, for your remarks, and thank you also for your service to our country. Our last panelist to speak, uh, certainly not the least, is Jeff Wingfield. Jeff is the Director of Environment, Government, and Public Affairs with the Port of Stockton. Jeff. Thank you all very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate, John, the invitation to come here, even though uh, you, you, I think I drew the short straw on having to go against all the regulatory agencies, but thank you. I appreciate it. Um, just to give you a little background on, on the Port of Stockton, uh, we are a bulk and break bulk facility. Uh, we bring in a lot of fertilizer, a lot of steel products. Um, we export a lot of sulfur, and hopefully we'll have containers soon if we can get our uh, marine highway project off, off the ground with the uh, Port of Oakland. Uh, we import and export roughly 3 million metric tons per year. We have approximately 200 vessels per year. And given different years, we're either the fourth or fifth busiest uh, port in California and the second largest inland port on the west coast. We're proud of this fact and especially because we're located in an area that currently has unemployment rates around 20% well above the state average. We are the economic engine and one of the largest job creators in the Stockton area. Uh, we currently have 2,000 acres in operation. Um, we, are, we are growing. We had uh, Diane Feinstein and back in 2000 uh, penned some special legislation to convey Rough and Ready Island, uh, a former Navy base, to the port, which tripled our size overnight, gave us uh, increased warehousing and, and seven new berths for the port. And that was, that was tremendous. That was, we, were, we were not in a good place prior to that. Uh, and just on Rough and Ready alone, since we've taken it over, we've had $2 billion in uh, private sector dollars already invested, and another $2 billion is planned uh, and in the planning phase now. Uh, as I mentioned, the Marine Highway Project is uh, an excellent opportunity that we hope succeeds. There are tremendous air quality and safety benefits that would arise from that project. And the idea is to take containers off of uh, vessels in Oakland and then put them on the San Joaquin, the Stockton Ship Channel, up to Stockton to get them off the roads. Um, so each year we have about $1 billion worth of cargo that crosses our dock. And each year we work with the Corps and the regulatory agencies for permits to dredge our ship channel, which really is our lifeline that connects Stockton to the rest of the world. You know, we're 70 miles, we're not, we're not on the coast, we're about 70 miles inland right up against I-5. Um, so each year, and each year we fight for funding in DC to, to fund the Corps to keep a 35-foot channel in the entire year round. And we haven't successfully accomplished this in more than 20 years. It's, I, I gave up. Uh, I went back as far as I could, and that was it. But, and right now, our channel is restricted to about minus 33 feet. No big deal, it doesn't seem like. Well, it is, and here's why. We, have a, uh, a, we bring in about 90% of the fertilizer for the Central Valley. And for every foot of draft lost, uh, above 35 feet, it cost our tenants approximately $300,000 per vessel. So if you multiply that by 200 vessel calls per year, that comes up to $60 million that's left on the table as our ships are calling three quarters loaded. We're also leaving jobs on the table that would be, be there to unload or load that, that cargo. So the result is an increased cost of fertilizer which equals an increased cost of food and reduces competitive, competitiveness of our California goods in the global market. And incidentally, those, those cargo get trucked back to uh, Oakland to, to be exported. So the Corps works with, re with the regulatory agencies to get the permits to protect fish and water quality. And these are, these are good things, and we support them. 
But over the years, the agency requirements have increased while the Corps continues to see cuts to its operations and maintenance budget. And we're a moderate use port, so we continue to get funding, but it is never enough. To complicate things even more, we share some costs with the Port of West Sacramento, and they are a low use channel and get less funding. If they receive no, less or no funding, the Port of Stockton gets even less dredging done per year. So with that reality, the port sees less and less money available, available for actually getting material out of the, the navigation channel. I'm glad to hear Stockton deepening project was brought up several times today, and many here and myself have been meeting with agencies, stakeholders, and interested parties to discuss solution to our project challenges. This has been a great opportunity to meet with many dynamic people and receive feedback. And one of the things that stuck in my head the most with meeting with these folks was, was one person mentioned that uh, they put more restrictive and more protective language in their permit to protect fish because the Corps had told them that they wanted to dredge 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, anybody who's been around any dredge projects knows that you know, if you can get probably 80% time uh, and you're operating 80% of the time, you're doing, you're doing pretty well. You know, you have clean outs, debris, equipment breakdowns that cause downtime consistently. And if the agency had known about these downtimes, they wouldn't have been as strict with the dredge requirements. So, in just kind of going off of what everyone else up here has said, that, uh, and my point would be that if there's better understanding and communication, there may be some common ground we can meet to make sure we're working together to protect the environment and keep our channels at the authorized depths with flat budgets heading into the future and to ensure that California can stay competitive in the global market and prepare to handle the next larger class ship size. We have uh, seen great things come out of working together. The Bay, is, as you all mentioned, has the LTMS, and the Delta had one for a few years as well. And we were able to work very well with the regional board and all the other agencies to establish a, a dredge material reuse plan and permit that now allows us to reuse dredge material without additional delays over 90% of the delta. So this has been tremendously beneficial as we continue to work with reclamation districts to get them material to bolster the fragile levee system at a significantly reduced cost. We're also working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to provide them dredge material at the Antioch Dunes National Wildlife Refuge to reestablish sand dunes for an endangered butterfly and three plant species. So, in closing, I'd just like to say, if we continue to work together, I know everyone is short on time, um, but I've, I think if everybody can make time to sit down and work up, go over all these projects and get everybody's issues on the table, uh, we'll be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'd like to encourage folks to pass any questions they may have forward on the blue cards. But before we start that, I'd like you all just to stand up for a second. Shake it out. Shake it out. Gentlemen, feel free to take off your jackets. Keep your socks on. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, if you could retake your seats, please. If you could cut your conversation off until adult refreshment hour later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll start things off with a question directed to Bruce. Bruce, what have you done that you can cite to ensure the economic vitality as well as the environmental integrity of the San Francisco Bay Area? What flexibility have you demonstrated? Being able to stand up with a sleep leg, that's probably the flexibility. Uh, I think it gets back to the points I made about uh, when we look at uh, the applications in context of the 404B1 guidelines, 
how can we come up with a project that works for uh, the applicant? How can we make sure that, that there is a successful project at the same time that we're making sure we're minimizing impacts? And so I think we can actually go through a list. The, the Colonel pointed out that uh, basically the, the Corps has approved 99% of the projects. And I, I would say in uh, my uh, 10 years as executive officer, and it was about 10 years that I was head of the watershed management and, and water quality certification program before that, I can think of only one, one project where we actually denied, and that was a case where uh, the Corps, uh, myself, EPA all sat in the room and, and told the applicant uh, that no, this won't, won't work. And they had brought their city manager along and he said, I, I haven't heard anything here today that would cause me to go back to uh, the city council and, and tell them to do anything different. And so all agencies sent a denial letter. And that's sort of the case of, of where we were trying to find a common ground, a middle ground, and there was no movement. And so I think uh, there's always going to be opportunities to make that movement, always opportunities to make that resolution. Because as I noted earlier, we're trying to allow all, all parties to achieve their goals, uh, economic or otherwise, while we achieve our goals. Thank you, Bruce. This question doesn't have a lot of specificity to it, but uh, Colonel Baker, how can I get a permit faster from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers? That's a great question, and when I know the answer, I'll let you know. Just kidding. Um, so, one of the first things I learned about permitting and, and regulatory actions with Army Corps of Engineers is though we may not always be the long pole in the tent, we are almost always the lightning rod. So, uh, but I don't like to be, nor does anybody want to be part of an organization that is known for being unresponsive. So we actively look, we, we have after action reviews with all of our permitting actions and especially all of the large ones to make sure that we are trying to constantly improve our process. So I would share these things with you today. The first thing is, know what the process is because some things must be done in sequence and there are regulations and, and delays and things that might be associated with it that we can't work around. They just have to be addressed one at a time. So if you know the process, that's the first thing and, and then you can endeavor on it uh, in, in the best way. If you don't, whether or not you know the process, start early, start really early. Um, and then I would also say that what we try to, to consult with our applicants on is try to latch on to a general permit, whether that be a, a nationwide general permit or a regional general permit for which all the consultations have already been made and that will greatly streamline the process when you can do that. Uh, because if we have to go on the individual permit then you have to go through all the consultations and the mitigation plans and everything else and you, you have to go about it alone and unafraid. And so I would tell you if you can, and we can help you. If you say here's what I really want to do is the best way to go about it, an individual permit or do you have some other vehicle in place to allow us to do what we want to do, then we can help you through that process. And so the, the general permit route I think is is among the best. And I will say that if you're a, a dredger, I think you're in better shape than some of the other folks that are, are maybe doing wetlands permitting or something like that. And, I, and, and I'll sing the praises of the LTMS group. I think that just having one permit application, and you, you might not like the difficulty and the, that with which you have to get that, obtain that permit, but at least you just come to one place and we're all sitting up here together and we have regular meetings and, and that's how we go about it. Because uh, even within the San Francisco district's area of responsibility, that is somewhat unique and not everybody enjoys that, that benefit. I wish and we will certainly work to try to improve the collaboration with all the resource agencies elsewhere in our region and throughout the Corps of Engineers. 
So know the process, start early, uh, try to get onto a general permit, and uh, keep pressing your, in uh, keep engaged, I would say. If you're not satisfied, go to that person's boss, go to that person's boss, uh, you, and then you can come talk to me. But uh, you're the best champion for your project, and that's what I would leave you with. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Baker. Um, here's one for Jeff. What can be done by organizations like yours and um, commercial interests with regard to the more extreme environmental organizations filing lawsuits with limited basis against ports and operations on the water? Wow. Um, if I knew that, I wouldn't be getting sued every now and then. But uh, no, you know what? It, I think it all goes back to CEQA reform at some point. You know, CEQA is being abused, and I, I think that a lot of folks understand that. And I think Jerry Brown was working on some a CEQA reform idea recently, and he's abandoned that now. I understand, but you know, it's got a pendulum has to. It's got to be you know, really for environmental review and not, not kind of as that, well, I don't like your project or I want a labor agreement out of you and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna sue you and over the environmental uh, aspects of your project. I don't know how to answer that any better than that. It's about as good a shot as anybody could give that one. Um, this question is for Bruce and Alexis. Uh, I'll try to narrow it. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah. What are your thoughts and reactions to uh, the Corps of Engineers three by three by three process? Would it be possible for your agencies to explore applying a similar model to the permitting process? Definitely. I mean, speaking first for the Bay Area, we need to be completely aligned with the Corps schedule. When we looked at the uh, the phases that were outlined there, there's the possibility between that second and third phase of the four phases for the core to fix on a particular alternative, and I say this hypothetically because you're going to be trying this out, um, we might have an idea of another alternative in a classic CEQA, NEPA-like world that has less impact, but we need to have informal discussions and good ongoing communication so that by the time you get to that third phase, we're all on board, the applicant, the core, the regulatory and resource agencies, and we're just refining um, the details of it. So while there is a formality and a timing to it, I'm hopeful that there can be some sharing of information about the, uh, the preferred alternative before it's a done deal. Because I think if we got to the point entering phase three that there were a done deal and the other agencies weren't on board, that three, three, um, wouldn't be as successful as it needs to be. That said, much of our discussion today has been around economic vitality and around efficiency and making much of our goods movement on road, on water, and for the California economy work. And I think if we can all do that uh, in the timing envisioned, it would be very much in our interest to continue to do that and to make that a habit for us. So the ability to communicate well and to have good documents to work with, um, I'm, I'm sure we can do this. And I, I imagine Bruce would say similarly. Quite so. Uh, again, calling on the, the Colonel's slides, that uh, there may be 900 projects in the Bay Area that may not all be in our region, but we're trying to get projects approved. We're trying to get projects resolved. And when either we don't get uh, the information up front or don't get everything we need to be able to move forward, everybody gets frustrated and everybody sort of go back into their corner. So I think having, uh, we already have the State Permit Streamlining Act that, that we try to adhere to. I try to remind staff that there's uh, no benefit of slowing down project approval. Let's move forward and get resolution. So having it spelled out up front would be useful, but all the time, that's our goal, is to get these resolved and move forward. Thank you, Bruce. 
I'm going to narrow two cards that came in. Um, and I'm going to direct the question for response again um, to Alexis and to Bruce. Consistent with this session's title, do you ever discuss the economic value of a project when reviewing a permit application? We agree that we must balance economic development with stewardship. But what can you say about efforts by the agencies to quantify or monetize the economic benefits, for example, of habitat restoration? We're very much dependent on the information provided by the applicant. Uh, we don't have a team of economists um, or other resource specialists. We tend, in all of our permitting work, to be working on the documents that the applicant, whether you or someone that you're affiliated with, has submitted to the core or to the L LTMS agencies as part of the project. So we don't have the budget, the contracting wherewithal, or the staffing to go out, but for, I would say, one or two extraordinary situations to be out there doing independent work. So in response to that question, we work with the information we have and with the research we can do, but we tend to find um, fairly common views among the four agencies regarding the values of the project. I would pick a couple of op options that come to mind in recent years. Um, the value of the Port of Oakland deepening projects is very clear. We don't need to challenge the value of why it makes sense to be able to accommodate modern container vessels. On the more painful side, let's imagine some of the smaller marinas in the Bay Area. Let's imagine some of the smaller harbors along the California coast. It will be very difficult. I'm quite concerned about what does it mean for those, <coughs> excuse me, harbors or entities' economic vitality 10 or 20 years from now. Um, I could foresee some difficulty from Humboldt on south um, being able to make the economics of that work in the budgeting scenarios that we talk about. At EPA, we don't have any money to put on the table for that kind of work. We just respond to the incoming permit applications. So the dynamics of those economics for the, the small size harbors is, is really vexing if we think from a California-wide perspective. But again, to return to the question and then to turn to Bruce, I, I don't have any um, real independent expertise to bring to it. In the situations where EPA is in the unique position of promulgating a water quality standard, we tend to get some of that extra help on an intermittent basis to promulgate a standard, but that is really quite exceptional and very seldom the rule. Probably the most commonplace where we uh, do have to consider the economics is when we're looking at an alternatives analysis for a project and it's a challenge sometime we do pull in uh, economists we have at state board to try to review that but also as Alexa says we're relying heavily on the material that's submitted uh, we try to look at okay how can we put a common-sense approach in here and recognize the value not only the project but also the value of uh, the impacts versus the mitigation. Uh, unfortunately, as part of the 404B1 guidelines, they spell out what you're supposed to consider as part of the economic analysis. And we do try to throw out the common sense to say, if you minimize your impact, you may be able to save money on doing your mitigation. And we're reminded, no, 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 you can't consider that as part of the uh, alternatives analysis. And it's frustrating a little bit. We do try to say, OK, what is the, the feasibility of getting this project done? And we recognize that also in all of this, time is money. That is, we can move forward, get a project complete, uh, resolve, and get a project successful in terms of the mitigation. We can get, uh, be done with monitoring and save everybody money. Uh, that is very, very much on our plate. So we do try to rely on information that's submitted to us, but then we also try to provide the common sense of saying, how can we streamline this? How can we make this uh, more feasible for all? This is our last question, and I'll direct it to Colonel Baker. We know that you, like your predecessors, will eventually move on to another command. 
while this is probably the midpoint in your tenure here, what do you think will have been your greatest accomplishment in this particular assignment? And what do you suspect will be your biggest disappointment? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to reflect in public. Um, <laughs> I, I guess uh, if the question is phrased greatest accomplishment, that assumes that I will have any accomplishments uh, during my tenure. Um, you know, I, I would say th that as far as uh, accomplishments, you, you know, the, the speed with which district commanders switch out is much faster than the speed with which we actually deliver projects. So I can't necessarily say, you know, we did any whatever project, because most of the things I would, during my tenure, will just carry from part of one phase to part of the same phase, maybe, or, or you know, three by three by three, we might actually get a three by three by three project, uh, a study done. That might be my greatest accomplishment. But I think that strengthening the relationships between our organizations is, is probably, I guess, what I'm proud of now and what I would say is going to be the thing that I will remain most proud of whenever I leave command next summer. And because that's what matters. In the military, we talk about uh, big T versus little t. So they say you have, the big T equals trust. So you have to have trust first, because the little t is the truth, and the truth changes. So you have to have the big T to, to hold you up when the little t changes. So I would say that, that, that if I'm able to, to strengthen our organizational relationships with each of our stakeholders, then that will have been my greatest accomplishment. As far as my greatest disappointment, that may be the fact that I have to leave district command next summer and, uh, and that I will not be able to, to stay longer. Although, well, I would just say, uh, I don't think there's a really good chance that I would be able to stay longer, but that would, that would probably be my uh, greatest disappointment is that I wouldn't actually be here to see some of the things, you know, the projects that we move along during two years, I won't actually be here to see them completed. So that's not really a cop out, but that's how I feel. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Colonel Baker. Thank you, audience. How about a round for yourselves and for our panel? <laughs>